Christmas came around and for myself, I decided to pick up a 4070 Ti Super. This is the most expensive graphics card that I've ever bought by far, coming in at just over $1,200 Canadian. I've also kind of got wondering if there was a way to put the power of this into a handheld. Many of these handhelds and mini PCs now come with USB 4. That means you can use graphics cards like the 4070 Ti Super as an eGPU, essentially giving these handhelds and mini PCs the full power of a desktop GPU. I gotta admit though, it is still incredible what you can play on these APUs. I've got nearly 24 hours gameplay in Black Myth Wukong, and this was nearly all on the ROG Ally X. This is another device that has that USB 4, so this is also a good candidate for an eGPU. Today I'm going to hook up this GPU to my handhelds to see what kind of performance I can get. And to do that, we're using something a little special. Let's hop in and take a closer look. In this box here is the AU Star AG02 eGPU kit. This has an 800 watt power supply and it should give us plenty of power for our eGPU. The nice thing about this is it's built all into one unit. Just a disclaimer as well, this eGPU kit was sent to me by Aostar, and the GPU was purchased with my own money. As with all my reviews, the company has no input in what I say. They haven't seen this video beforehand, and of course, I'm going to give you guys my honest thoughts to what I think about it. So let's hop in and take a closer look at the Aostar AG02 eGPU kit. In the box, we get a couple little cards telling us about the support on the device. They also have a little warranty card in here as well. Let's take a look at the accessories box first. We get a USB 4 cable. This is capable of 40 gigabits per second at 240 watt charging. The eGPU only supports 100 watt charging out to your device, but this is still a good cable to have. We also get three 8 pin connectors for the PCIe, a nice heavy duty power cable, and of course an Oculink cable. I don't have Oculink on any of my devices, so unfortunately I won't be able to test this. The only other thing in the box is this large foam packaging. Inside this, we find the eGPU kit. And I already gotta say it, but this eGPU kit is solid. This feels like a huge block of metal. To show you just how heavy this is, let's put it on the scale and check it out. This eGPU kit almost comes in at 2 kilograms coming in at a staggering 1,883.5 grams. Let's go to their website and take a closer look at the specs and the pricing. This goes for 249 US dollars. All things considered, that's not a bad price for what you're getting. A lot of those old Razer eGPU kits were pretty expensive. This, however, has a lot more features to it and a lot more benefits. They've recently upgraded this as well, so this only had a 400 watt power supply in it initially, and now it's been up to 800 watts. We have USB 4 and Oculink on this one. This also provides 100 watt charging for your devices. They do recommend using cards up to the 4070 Super or the 7700 XT. You are going to lose a little bit of performance going with USB 4 over Oculink, but you're still going to have a pretty good experience. Another unique thing about this is it supports PCIe 4.0 by 4. The GPD eGPU that I looked at recently only supports PCIe 4.0 by 3. That one was also really loud too. Having the ability to just use whatever GPU you want essentially is going to let us have much quieter operation. I'm curious to see how loud that power supply is, but I'll take a closer look at everything once we get it set up. It's also worth noting that Oculink does not support hot swapping and the USB 4 pretty much doesn't either, but we'll take a closer look at that too. My question today is, is this worth 249 US dollars if you're in the market for an eGPU? I'm not sure, but let's find out. On the top side of the kit, we have the PCI Express slot. On the front, we have the power switch, the Oculink port, and the USB 4 port. On the left side, we have an air intake vent and a lock for the GPU. You can also see the rubber feet on the bottom from here. On the right side, we have the 800 watt power supply and the power plug. On the other side, we have those three 8 pin PCIe power connectors. It's also worth noting that the only part of this that's plastic is the top. The sides and the bottom are completely solid aluminum. My question is how hard is it to set this up and get everything working? As far as the GPU goes, this is definitely not a requirement to go this overboard. This is the only GPU I have on hand outside of my editing rig that I can use for this. 
I pulled this out of my mini PC that I built for Christmas. This does a good job at running all my games in 4K60 with ultra settings. First thing you want to do is to open the lock, then just put the GPU in. There's also a little rubber clip on the side that holds the GPU in spot while you're tightening it. For GPUs like this one, you're going to need your adapter that came with your video card. This is going to take us from two 8-pin connectors to the new PCIe standard. I'm going to plug all this in quick. I found this adapter cable pretty hard to get in. I think that's because this slot on my GPU is extremely tight. Wiggling it back and forth ever so slightly got it in. You can also use a zip tie to kind of make these look a little better, but I'm more interested in seeing if this works and how well it works. So next, let's get this set up by plugging in the power cable and connecting it to the handheld. I've got it connected to the Legion Go through the USB 4 cable that they included, which is about a foot and a half. With USB 4 cables, you don't want anything that's too long, as that can severely degrade the performance. Let's turn on the eGPU next. The fans on the GPU itself are now spinning. This shows that it's ready to go. You can also see that the power is connected to the device and it's charging the Legion Go. Let's turn on the Legion Go. If you're using this on a handheld or on a mini PC, you're obviously playing this dock to something like a TV. I'm gonna connect the HDMI to the eGPU, then I'm gonna hook up a USB hub to the Legion Go and make sure everything works. We'll also take a look at how to install this properly. I've connected it and it's not showing the GPU in the device manager, so I'm gonna go manually download the driver next just to see if that gets it showing. I'm gonna download the latest game ready driver. It gave me an error saying NVIDIA installer cannot continue. It's checking the compatibility and then all of a sudden it just okayed it and now it's letting me install it. I'm just gonna install the graphics adapter, not the app. After a few seconds, the 4070 Ti Super is already showing in the device manager. It's a pretty good sign to see this already working. The graphics driver is not done installing yet, so I'm going to leave this for a little while. Let's let it complete. Okay, now the installer is finished, so let's click close on that. The display settings is still only showing one display out, so I'm going to give this a restart, then we'll check and see if it works. After a restart, it's still only showing the Legion Go display. I'm not sure why. You have to run this NVIDIA Error 43 fixer. This will fix the adapter and the registry and restart the driver. All you have to do is just run this once and it should be good to go. I'm currently running this at 1440p. This is connected to the EVGA XR1 Pro capture card. One thing I'm also noticing is this is not charging the Legion Go. I'm not sure why, but it was before. To get this to charge your device in general, first thing you have to do is mentioned earlier, you have to connect your GPU, then hook up the power to it. Once that's done, make sure that light comes on. It will be flashing at first, then press the button on the front of the eGPU to turn it on. Next, connect the USB 4 cable to your device. You'll see the charging light come on, or in the case of the Legion Go, you'll see the screen flash showing the battery percentage. It'll also show you that it's charging. After a second, the screen will shut off and it'll go just into its regular charging mode. Then you can turn on the Legion Go or the Ally X or whatever device you're connecting this to. Now the device will charge correctly and you can use it. Just to show you as well, it is charging at the full 100 watts, showing me 20 minutes to fully charged from 70%. Let's go take a peek at GPU-Z just to see exactly how quick this is running. This GPU kit is supposed to run at PCIe 4.0 by 4. So I'm curious to see if it is actually running at the correct speeds. Once installing GPU-Z, it does show me that it is running at PCIe by 4, 4.0. It does go down to 1.1. This is typical for Windows 11, but once you start the render test, it does jump to 4.0. Everything else in this card seems to show correctly. This is idling at 36 degrees Celsius, which is pretty good. Hardware info also shows us a couple different things. This is currently idling at about six watts on the GPU and it's gone up to about 40 watts, but I haven't had any graphically intensive things running yet. It's always scary starting up a benchmark because you don't know how well it's gonna run. Heaven benchmark is working correctly and I'm getting over 250 FPS. That GPU is also pushing upwards of 210 watts. And the power supply on the eGPU kit is really quiet still. But it seems to be running good, over 200 FPS consistently, and I'm not getting any stutters. 
while we're waiting for the games to download, let's head over to the NVIDIA control panel. There's a couple things you probably want to turn on in here. I like to turn on the low latency mode. You can set this to ultra, but I like to go with what Blurbuster suggested, which is just the on option. You want to set your max frame rate to three below what your monitor's refresh rate is. So if mine was set to 144 hertz, I would set this to 141. I'm going to leave this off for now, just during testing. I like to use the normal mode as that allows the GPU to adjust its frequency as needed. The maximum performance mode is much more aggressive with clocks. Blurbusters also suggest turning on VSync in the NVIDIA control panel. Even if you have a VRR display, I'll leave that article linked down below. For this test though, I'm just going to leave that off. I do also suggest going over to the resolution page, going to NVIDIA color settings, and using full RGB output. This is usually going to give you a much more vibrant picture. In your settings window, make sure to head down to gaming as well, then click on game mode. Make sure to turn that on. Underneath that, we also have the graphic options. Click on that. Make sure optimizations for windowed games is turned on, then click on advanced graphic settings, and make sure to turn on hardware accelerated GPU scheduling. You can also adjust which GPU you're using here in your games. If you let Windows decide, it usually picks the high performance option, which should be your eGPU. But if you have a lower demanding game, you can also use your integrated graphics through here as well. However, I'm just going to let Windows decide for this test. I do want to try some graphically intensive games. I'm going to set the FPS to uncapped. The graphics memory is showing here correctly at 16 gigabytes. I've set this to exclusive full screen mode at 1440p with 100% resolution scale. I'm also going to turn off VSync so we can see how much FPS we're getting. Shut off motion blur and the rest of these settings I'm going to max out. So it is running really smooth as you can see. There's not too many stutters either which is pretty good. I'm sitting at about 180 FPS. If you check out my eGPU optimization guide there's a few settings in there that can help with these little micro stutters. Let's leave VSync off so we can just see how much FPS we're getting. So yeah, very impressive. About 160 FPS. Not bad. Let's step it up and try something a little harder to run. Ghost of Tsushima is a much more demanding game. I'm going to set this to exclusive full screen at 1440p. I'm also going to set the refresh rate to 144 Hz and shut off VSync. I'm also going to try running this without DLSS and dynamic resolution scaling is going to be turned off. I'm going to set anti-aliasing to DLAA, NVIDIA Reflex is turned on, and I'm going to make sure frame gen is shut off. As far as the graphic settings go, I'm going to turn this to the very high preset. This is going to push more onto the GPU than on the CPU. If this was set to 1080p, it would be more CPU bound. With this running on there, I'm seeing around 90 FPS. This is with all the settings maxed out, and it looks breathtaking. I'm also not noticing any stuttering in this title because this one will compile the shaders before the game starts. 80 to 90 FPS with no frame gen, ultra settings, no DLSS. This is very impressive. Of course, I am using an expensive GPU, so your results might vary. I had some pretty interesting results with the AMD eGPU that I was using before. Occasionally you get stutters. And without those tweaks that I showed, it was pretty hard to get that thing running consistently. However, this is working just like it would if you were to play on a regular computer. If you haven't played Ghost of Tsushima yet, this is one I definitely recommend checking out. I paid nearly full price for this and I don't regret it. I had so much fun playing this on a handheld. What's interesting to note as well is that we are actually experiencing a CPU bottleneck, in this case more than a GPU bottleneck. Looking at the top corner, GPU usage is only at 78%. The Z1 Extreme is a good processor, but in this case, you definitely need something a little bit better. Let's try turning this up to 4K. Now the GPU is pegged at 100%, but I'm still getting 65 FPS. And this looks even more graphically impressive than it was before. Instead of pushing 2.5 million pixels, we're now pushing 8 million. 4K on this game is just incredible. For me anyways, this is why I bought this GPU was 4K60. I wanted to use it on my TV as a console essentially in my mini PC. But it's great to see that we can take full advantage of this GPU over this eGPU kit. This is actually pretty close to the results that I was getting on my mini PC. Over USB 4, I thought I would see more of a bottleneck. I'm actually really impressed. I do have one more title that's even more graphically demanding. Let's move over to that and see how well that one works. 
for Wukong, I have DLSS set to 90%. I've also turned off ray tracing. Now go ahead and apply those. I'm also going to set this to 1440p and I'm going to leave off VSync. Motion blur is also off and the graphics options are all set to very high. So let's see what kind of results we can get. This is an extremely graphically demanding game. I'm getting about 85 FPS and it's using all of the GPU. I'm nearly capping it at 97% usage with 216 watts on the GPU. Occasionally there's going to be a few little stutters here. This is because it's GPU bound. This is one game where you do want to use DLSS. So I'm going to go back in there. I'm going to turn on VSync. I'm going to leave this at 1440p. This is still recommended to use 75% anymore. It just says it's too much for the card. I'll leave that at 75%. Let's go ahead and apply the graphic changes. Much smoother. I don't know, this is pretty impressive. Getting a solid 60 FPS. We're not maxing out the GPU. Again, this is just where I was hoping to use it was 60 FPS at 4K. If I push this to 4K, I do have to turn down a few settings and I also have to turn down DLSS. So 1440p and 4K is definitely doable with this card. I'm just impressed with how good this eGPU is working. I'm getting a pretty decent experience nearly out of box. After running the script and installing the driver, it feels like I'm playing on a desktop. The Legion Go is currently set to 30 watts, but even in the performance preset, this is not too bad. All the cores on the Z1 Extreme are under 60%. The one core is being pushed a little bit more, closer to that 60. The other ones seem to be hovering around under 50. So it's not bad. What do you guys think of the gaming performance with this eGPU kit? As for me, I'm extremely impressed. I'm able to use nearly the full power of this GPU over USB 4. It looks absolutely breathtaking. Minimal stuttering, but I am using a lot of system RAM. Remember the Legion Go only has 16 gigabytes. I currently have six gigabytes set to the APU. So if you were to use this more docked than handheld, you probably wanna to go to the BIOS and set it to automatic. That way you're gonna get more RAM for your games. Games like this are probably dipping into the page file, which isn't a terrible thing, but system RAM runs much quicker. A better use case would probably be with the Ally X because that one has 24 gigs of RAM and the MSI Claw 8 AI Plus has 32, which is the same as what I would recommend for most desktops. Juggling two AMD drivers on a handheld with the Z1 Extreme is an extremely difficult task. Using NVIDIA on this just makes it so much easier. Gaming performance is really impressive. Let's take a look at a few more things because the board power draw on this unit in particular is usually under about 220 watts. Having an 800 watt power supply gives me a lot of headroom on this. 4070 Ti Super works really good on mine. Just unplugging this after playing all those games, the GPU is still running pretty cool. The metal on the eGPU is still pretty cool at about 35 degrees to the touch. That's about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. There's a little fan on the side where the power cable is. The power supply hasn't gotten hot enough that the fan has come on. Even if I was to record the audio samples from this, I don't think I would be able to pick it up without hearing a lot of hissing from my mic. It runs that quiet. The loudest thing that I heard while playing games was the Legion Go. The fan on that thing is definitely pretty loud. What do I think about this eGPU setup? If you want a little bit more power on the Ally X or the Legion Go when you're at home, this is a great option. It's an all-in-one solution that doesn't require a lot of tinkering. The build quality is extremely good and it's solid metal. All the cables and everything worked out of the box. I'd say the biggest thing for me was probably this cable that was going into the GPU. It's extremely hard to get in there, but that is all on Asus because that's where that came from. The eGPU kit though, I definitely like this one and it gets a solid thumbs up for me. I've used this for a while too and I've had no crashes due to GPU drivers or stability issues. I'll probably put this over on my TV stand when I get another extra GPU. This one's definitely going back in my mini PC, but I do like this and I do want to keep this one around. It was a lot easier for me to use this than an all-in-one solution like the one from GPD. There's way less tinkering. So if you have a handheld and you're looking for a good way to make that into a full PC, I think this is a great way to do it. If you have any questions regarding the eGPU kit, make sure to ask in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. And as always, thanks for watching.